to approve the minutes as published. Yeah. All those in favor say aye. <laughs> How bad was it? Just get here. Any opposed, same sign? Motion passed. We just approved the minutes without you. Since you ran it last, there was six seconds to spare. You can approve the minutes. Did you see anything in there? No, I didn't see anything. <laughs> Perfect. Item number three continued from last month, A22-18, the wildest. Thank you. This application was received in order to accommodate platting and zoning of property to allow for residential development in a future church. The developer is proposing single family dwellings to the north and a church zoned R1A. However, proposed lot 17, block 5, will remain agriculturally zoned until an application for replat and rezoning for a planned unit development is submitted at a later date. The 25 foot wide lot for the 10 foot trail for the park district will be zoned public facilities. The November 8th meeting the planning and zoning at the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting, the applicant requested this item be to continued to allow for consideration of a cul-de-sac option. The applicant has resubmitted the application with a revised plat and narrative describing the request and justification for cul-de-sacs. Block 1 of the plat has been reconfigured to include 12 lots with frontage around two cul-de-sacs as opposed to the originally proposed configuration. Based on the revised plat, the Public Works Department provided information outlining additional costs of snow removal, street sweeping, and repairs for cul-de-sacs. In a typical year, the city must remove and haul snow out of each cul-de-sac four times at a cost of just under $1,000 per removal. With additional maintenance costs for things such as street sweeping, repairs, and upkeep, the expense incurred by the city is estimated at roughly $5,000 per cul-de-sac annually. This yearly maintenance cost does not include the initial cost of construction or future reconstruction. Due to the added cost to the city, staff does not generally recommend the use of cul-de-sacs unless necessary for the dead end turnaround. It is recommended that the city approve the proposed subdivision and rezoning application on the basis that is consistent with city plans and ordinances with recommended conditions of approval as followed. An updated drainage plan is approved by the city engineer and the proposed cul-de-sacs on block one be removed and the lots reconfigured as generally shown on the original plat presented at the November 8th Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. Um, an email was also received this afternoon from an area property owner who supports the cul-de-sac option that was provided for you. This is a con uh, pardon? You said, did you say the recommendation Correct. So that's the recommendation. That is the recommendation. The applicant is submitting an application for the cul-de-sac option. Staff is recommending. Staff, staff's recommendation is not go with the cul-de-sac. Correct. Go with the original layout, which has the block configuration. Right, based on the public works director's um, okay. consideration. This is a continued public hearing, and the applicant is available to answer any questions as well. It's a continued public hearing, so. So is that, could we leave that open? Yeah. Yes. So I will then kind of public. Do you want to speak, sir? Yeah, I'm an applicant here. Come on up, uh, if you wish to add to the story. Sure. You know, it's here a month ago, I think it was election night, the last Tuesday. It's always something exciting here in snowstorm or elections. Um, but thanks for hearing the plat. Um, you know, we've been kicking this around as far as the best kind of layout for this, uh, for just this remaining portion of the wilds and um, kind of back and forth with the long narrow lots versus the cul-de-sacs. Um, there's about 20 other cul-de-sacs in the wilds development. Um, we're just finishing up the last little piece of the wild, so it's, it's consistent with that. I, I understand there's, there's a little bit of added cost for, for some of the upkeep. Um, but we feel this is this is the best solution. Neighbors like this option. Um, 
Mike, Michael, I think, was the one that sent the email in. I talked to him today, um, last month. It was um, uh, Shania Eagleson was here, kind of, um, and she was in favor of the cul-de-sac option as well. Um, the, the ordinance still states that curvilinear cul-de-sacs and loop shaped or other similar type streets shall be encouraged. So that's still in the, the ordinance. So we're still following the, the city ordinance. Um, so we, we think this is the best, best solution to it. I think it's gonna look better. They're, the lots are gonna be more marketable. Um, and in the grand scheme of things, two more cul-de-sacs out of uh, the 19, I think it's 19 or 20 that are there right now. Um, I think it's a, it's a good trade-off. Uh, in the entire Wilds development, if you count them up um, throughout the whole development. So it kind of fits with, with the overall look of the development. There had been various master plans over the years for this remaining area, and um, we, decre we decreased the number of cul-de-sacs that were going to be in this section in all the future plans as well. So, and, and again, it's limited a little bit because of where um, the street, the 50th Avenue, needs to connect, and that, that's why it's, it's either long, narrow lots or, or the cul-de-sacs. So, happy to answer questions if you have any. Yes, with the cul-de-sacs. From the developer, from the neighbors, uh, from our realtors who will be marketing the lots. Everybody likes this. Except the, uh, the maintenance and snow removal. <laughs> I don't know about the rest of the city. Um, I have a question. Does it make a difference to like property value when we look at cul-de-sacs versus the other types of lots? I probably can't answer that question on property values. I don't know if uh, you guys have a calculation for that. Anybody know? <clears throat> uh, maybe just so I understand your question. Well, I'm just wondering if like tax revenue goes up, if property value is higher, if that offsets the cost of maintenance a little bit. Gotcha. Uh, it, it, it would, um, I think a back of the envelope estimate is something probably close to 80,000 extra dollars worth of property value would be needed to you know, generate you know, almost a thousand dollars. And I, I hate to do an estimate on the fly here, but um, certainly there is a, that is a, a correlation, yeah. And do we know, and this isn't for you, I'm sorry, but do we know the, the $5,000 per cul-de-sac extra cost to the city, is that, over and above what that maintenance cost would be if it was designed a different way, or is that just the cost of maintaining a cul-de-sac period? That's a, an estimate from the city's public works department based on their, I think they looked at the actual cost to clearing out a cul-de-sac based on a previous you know work order. Um, right, I mean, they have to maintain that regardless of whether it's a cul-de-sac or not. That's, I'm just wondering if it's, like yep. three thousand dollars for a regular street versus five for a cul-de-sac, or is it five above what it would cost? In this otherwise? case, in this case, it would be five above. Okay. Um, because you essentially be adding to the uh, otherwise otherwise a straight street. The previous okay. version, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank and, you. Did you have anything else? No, nope. thanks, thanks for I have a question for, is it Blake, is that right? Yeah, Blake Carlson. Um, no. Question, so if there are cul-de-sacs, that's more pavement from a maintenance standpoint, it's also more pavement from a construction standpoint and probably more pavement from a special assessment standpoint. Is that, I guess, from your market standpoint, obviously specials are a lightning rod issue, is that have you done any calculations to see how much this additional pavement would cost from a special standpoint? We, we haven't done that calculation. It's tough to, to know the, right. you know, what it goes out to bid, what that difference will be. Um, and then we think it's worth it, I guess, for the marketability. Sure, of, of the sure. Lots. Yeah, that's fair. Um, and then last question, you're asking this all to be zoned R1A 
Have you considered, are there other options other than single family residential for these, this cul-de-sac area in particular? Um, you know, I, I guess what, the, the thinking has always been that it would be single family abutting the existing single family that's there. Um, you know, we are proposing that large lot will be a church across the street and then some, um, you know, PUD similar to the ranch there right next to it. So, okay. Thank you. Where's the church? Um, block six there, the large lot that, uh, be along 52nd Avenue and 5th Street. I have one more question for the city um, and that I, I, I'm really hung up on the point about the code and the ordinance still saying we encourage cul-de-sacs. Has anyone proposed a change to the code or the ordinance or is that just still standing exactly as is today? Uh, so the applicant is correct that is still in our, our ordinances and so we have a situation where we have um, you know, it's a policy direction from our comprehensive plan that is misaligned with the, the code as written um, and I'd say that we do have a probably a long list of code updates that are, are necessary and needed um, and I would just reference back maybe to um, a few months back when we talked about the planning needs assessment there were some code updates that were identified as part of that assessment and so the, uh, the way that the, uh, the, uh, the, the, that project kind of broke it out is there's probably some short-term quick hitter items that we can clean up ourselves, uh, but looking more long-term, you know, we, we'd probably be looking at some type of a comprehensive update, you know, a few years um, into the future. Um, the current code, I think, was written or um, comprehensively looked at, I think, last in, I think, the mid-'80s, if I'm not mistaken, so... That one will have to come back before the planning and zoning, and I believe they're proposing some sort of townhouse development. For okay, so they are in, uh, higher density. Right. to not approve the cul-de-sacs that's my that's my motion is to approve it as submitted by the developer sorry guys second it okay it's been moved and seconded to approve the council with the Aye. 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 Any opposed? Same sign. Thank you. So item number four, uh, this is, uh, we're bringing this back to you uh, in follow up to a discussion we had with the Planning and Zoning Commission last month. Uh, hopefully some of you recall that conversation. I know some of you probably uh, weren't here for that conversation, but um, I'll do my best to, to kind of summarize where we're at with that discussion um, as, a, as best I can, and certainly feel free to ask any questions of me along the way. This is in relation to that, yep. And I can uh, touch base on that as well. 
Um, but ultimately, what are we asking for tonight? What we're asking for is your recommendation to the City Commission and, um, to initiate a downtown master plan uh, utilizing some grant funding that we have uh, received from the state for a placemaking master plan in addition to um, some city funds to help uh, beef up the, the scope of work of that study. Um, and so maybe to start with, I'll, I'll kind of reference the, uh, the memo that's included in your packet here. Um, maybe to start with some general background on uh, the conversation dating back to the 2010-2011 time period when the uh, city adopted the and created and ad adopted the Cheyenne Street and Main Avenue uh, framework study. Um, that is essentially the city's existing um, you know, downtown master plan for, for maybe lack of a better term. Um, a number of recommendations from that study have been implemented. Um, that I think was one of the original studies that really um, pointed the downtown area, especially Cheyenne Street and a little section of Main Avenue there, um, in a new direction in terms of recognizing that uh, what was there um, previously, so that, um, that timeline, uh, was kind of um, an outdated commercial strip, very auto-oriented, and, and um, the city at the time recognizing that it, um, it needed some attention. It wasn't really uh, um, maybe keeping up with the uh, market demands of the time. And so that was really the, uh, the first study that um, took a look at doing something different. Um, some of the uh, catalytic changes, I think, that came out of that study was to re um, reimagine that corridor as you know, potential higher density mixed use corridor. It did have some recommendations for examining uh, zoning changes, um, such as we have today with the downtown mixed use, that DMU um, zoning district that's specific to that um, downtown area. And then there was a number of um, um, different uh, mixed use projects that kind of came out of that, that conversation over the past decade or so. Um, also included in that is uh, the, the Cheyenne Street um, road diet or street redesign um, that has that, that more urban type um, design to the, the public space as well. Um, in 2018, the city adopted the West Fargo 2.0 Comprehensive Plan, which kind of further um, added on to some of the, the vision that was originally talked about in the Cheyenne Street Main Avenue Framework Study. Um, that was a the city's comprehensive plan, and so you know, it didn't dive very deep into downtown, but it did point us in the direction of some uh, potential focus areas and some need, um, especially relating to economic development more generally um, across the city. Um, and so more recently, uh, like we talked about, a uh, with the last item, um, as you all are aware, we're currently in the process of going um, through and creating that um, planning needs assessment. Um, the early results of uh, a lot of the conversation um, regarding what the city should be focusing on in terms of um, planning needs in the, the near term and, and kind of midterm um, future. Um, that study pointed to the need for uh, a, a, an updated downtown master plan as, as probably a, a sh looking at a short-term priority need for something like that. Uh, just recognizing that the current framework plan is over a decade old now and the context is completely changed now. Um, and so that, that plan is um, you know, not, not super useful in, in terms of its recommendations. And so taking a, a fresher look at the downtown is, is, um, is kind of a need that was identified. Uh, as mentioned, the city did receive that $100,000 placemaking planning grant for downtown, and so uh, recognizing the opportunity to, um, to hire a consultant to take a look at placemaking downtown, this does seem like a great opportunity for the city to broaden that scope in order to um, create more of a, a, a downtown master plan instead of just a plan that's focused on placemaking specifically. And so included in your packet is a, a slightly updated version of what you all saw last month. Um, this is just a downtown master plan project overview uh, that attempts to just lay out generally what, um, what a downtown master plan might encompass. Uh, I, I would say that this is still in, in somewhat of a, a draft format as we continue to have conversations. Um, we did bring this to the city commission last week for their kind of initial input. Um, and we, uh, based on some of the direction that the city commission had, we continued to have uh, conversations, especially with some of the uh, stakeholders um, along the, the Cheyenne Street corridor downtown um, and some of the adjacent uh, residents in that area specifically. And so you all uh, hopefully received an email with a, a link to a survey. Um, that's a result of some of those ongoing um, discussions and, and kind of further uh, soliciting input from, from potential stakeholders here. Um, 
And so not much has changed in here from what you saw um, last month. Um, yeah, again, I won't, won't go through it in great detail here. Hopefully you had a chance to read through it. What I will just emphasize again is the, the plan focus areas. Um, kind of reshuffle these a little bit. Um, but these are, are kind of what uh, staff has in mind in terms of what we would be, um, if, if this was to move forward, uh, we would be looking to create a request for proposals in order to solicit um, proposals from professional consulting firms, uh, which the city could then um, select any that they deem appropriate or choose not to move forward with uh, a consultant if, um, if uh, we don't get one that we like. Um, but in essence, what we'd be asking for is that the, the consultant respond or put together a scope of work that somehow incorporates um, these five items in addition to any other um, you know, items that the City Commission or the Planning and Zoning Commission would like to see. Uh, number one there is placemaking. Again, that, it, that's really um, intended to be what the, uh, the grant is, is, is um, intended to be used for. Includes everything from urban design to street activity, uh, public art, uh, anything that uh, helps create um, that, that vibrancy that the city is looking for um, in terms of, uh, I think the way that the comprehensive plan puts it is um, to create downtown West Fargo as the cultural center um, of the city. Uh, number two is business and economic development, uh, really taking a look at some of our incentives perhaps, um, also uh, bringing the, the downtown yards, um, the yards downtown business Associ association into the conversation. Um, how we can, the city can perhaps partner with uh, businesses and, and what kind of you know, relationships we can build to, to create a better downtown environment, um, not just from the city standpoint, but from um, really any stakeholder involved in, in some of those conversations. Number three, relating to, to parking and access. Uh, parking is one of those items that comes up a lot um, um, for, for different reasons, whether it's on-street parking or um, a potential uh, developer coming in and, and potentially looking at doing a project downtown. Um, but recognizing that we're looking for that um, walkable, mixed-use, urban-type product on downtown Cheyenne Street, um, how do we want to incorporate? How do they incorporate parking in, into something like that? And how do we maybe start looking at downtown as a as a district uh, for parking, um, as opposed to the traditional uh, way that we handle parking, um, requiring each and every property owner to, to um, handle their their parking individually. Um, also included that is access, and so. Um, potentially looking at some you know, bike and pedestrian um, connectivity in and out of downtown, how do people um, get in and, out, you know, in and out of downtown um, when they're not driving as well? Is there opportunities for you know, transit improvements and things like that might fit under that uh, umbrella category as well? Uh, number four, infill redevelopment and land use. Um, this is really, I think, looking at um, as downtown, if we continue to see a, a successful downtown that continues to grow, continue to see um, new projects, uh, recognizing that um, you know, the context again, uh, the downtown is in the middle of a residential neighborhood. Some of our older or, or oldest um, homes are, are located immediately adjacent to downtown, and so uh, there would be some um, some potentially tough conversations that the city would or tough decisions the city would have to make in in terms of some of the uh, potential growing pains that come along with. Uh, that type of change and so how do we kind of map that out and, and game plan for um, if and when um, you know, that, those types of situations arise and how do we kind of manage that growth as best we can for all of our citizens. Um, and the last one, number five, that's a new addition from, from what was included last uh, month and it was always there but we just wanted to bring some attention to it based on some of the feedback that we've been receiving. Um, we just called it other plan elements. Um, and this is just trying to, to bring some attention to the fact that as part of this, this project for all of these elements, a big portion of this project would be <clears throat> a robust public and stakeholder participation um, component to this. <coughs> Excuse me. And so this is where, something that we would also be asking a consultant team to put uh, together in their uh, proposed scope of work is is some type of a, a participation strategy uh, for the project in general to make sure that we're reaching out and engaging with all of the, the different downtown um, stakeholders, whether they be residents or business owners or potential businesses that are maybe looking to, to come downtown, uh, making sure that everybody's included in the, in the conversation. Uh, and then just some of the, the project management coordination and either be a, a project steering committee um, and different things like that. So um, 
and, and lots of that, those types of elements are pretty, pretty standard stuff for this type of project anyway. So, um, so that's really, I think, the biggest change. I think a lot of the feedback that we've been receiving to date has been pretty on key with these, these plan focus areas. Um, I would emphasize too, or just call out that uh, we did include a little study area section here um, based on a number of questions we received as well. Uh, the way that we have it um, written up here is that the primary focus area would be that Cheyenne Street and, and Main Avenue um, T, if you will, as kind of the heart of downtown. Uh, but also having a secondary focus area on the surrounding blocks and potentially some of those nearby amenities that maybe aren't, you might not think of as being you know, in downtown you know, proper per se, um, but that certainly are in walking distance to downtown and could certainly be an amenity to um, uh, to the downtown area, whether it be the river, the library, different park facilities, um, you know, what have you. Um, and then lastly, I would just uh, highlight here that I think we, we mentioned this last month, but with the placemaking grant from the state, there is an October 1st, 2023 deadline um, for which uh, for the city to utilize those funds and to submit receipts. The way that the grant work is it is a reimbursement type grant, and so the city would be required to uh, front the money for the project and then get reimbursed uh, for that $100,000 on the back end um, upon submittal of um, the receipts and the various documentation of the work being done. And so there is, you know, the clock is ticking on us, um, if you will, for um, in relation to the grant funding. And so uh, we do wanna, um, you know, get this ball rolling, um, if you will, and, and that's why we're here tonight looking for the Planning and Zoning Commission's uh, recommendation to the City Commission to initiate this project and, and direct staff to um, put out an RFP to, uh, to get a consultant on board. Um, the other thing I would mention too is that we have uh, kind of zeroed in a little bit on, on project budget. Right now, the way that we've got it um, estimated anyway is that um, $100,000 will be coming from a placemaking grant and then a recommendation for an additional $80,000 from the city for a total project cost of $180,000. That would be a not to exceed <laughs> budget number. Um, there's a number of different ways we could kind of handle the budget question when it comes to the RFP. Um, you know, the budget could be, for example, <clears throat> one of the uh, selection criteria. And so, you know, the city could weight, you know, the overall budget is, you know, pretty heavily as a selection criteria in order to uh, you know, ask that consultants put in a, you know, their, their best offer based on uh, the scope of work that we're looking for. Ultimately, um, the city, once a, a consultant is selected, or a, a recommendation from a selection committee is, is um, put forward to the city commission, we would be looking for a, a kind of a no negotiated contract that would um, specify the, the ultimate scope of work and the ultimate project budget um, but we would uh, go through that RFP process before we would have that in front of the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Planning and Zoning Commission and, and City Commission for, for kind of approval of that contract. So that's, uh, that's what we're looking for tonight. I'll, I'll stop talking and see if you all have any questions for me. Aaron, I got a couple of questions. Thanks. This is good, I think a good step to help uh, I don't know, bring some energy to downtown and some people and all that stuff and maybe help prioritize the city's focus of how to, uh, how to realize that vision, I guess. So appreciate your work on this. Um, couple just quick questions. The $180,000 budget, and it looks like you've got about six months to spend it. Is that deadline pretty firm or is there a way for the I guess that, that gets to be a pretty aggressive study and I'm concerned about, you know, everybody's busy and whatnot, being able to meet that time frame. $30,000 a month, that's almost one full-time employee working on it. Yep, yeah. well, that's a very good question. And I think um, maybe to, to talk a little bit more about the, the timeline, um, the October 1st deadline, <clears throat> That's um, going to be specifically for the placemaking element to this plan. And so uh, staff um, has had some conversations with the state of North Dakota. This grant is coming to us through the North Dakota Department of Commerce. Um, and so we have had some conversations with them just 
first of all, making sure that it was okay with them that we add to the, the scope of study, add to the grant, which it, it definitely is. Um, they were all for it. They thought it um, brought some really good synergy to what uh, the intent of the grant was um, in the first place. And then we did clarify with them too that it's, it's really the placemaking element to this plan is what needs to be done by October 1st. And that would need to be, you know, not fully complete, but substantially complete. And then anything, you know, outside of that, anything that's not being grant funded could have a longer timeline. And so I think we would structure the RFP and just let consultants know that sure. this is the way that the funding works. These are the different um, kind of, you know, kind of have two de deadlines, if you will. Deadline number one is for that placemaking element, and then things like parking and stuff can maybe be backloaded or, or, or um, right. you know, on the back end of the study, for example, with a little bit longer timeline there. Okay. But that is a very real <laughs> reality. Is is we are uh, um, the deadline, the the timeline is not very long, and so. Mm -hmm. um, well, sometimes those are great ways to get studies done. Is really just focus on it and you know hammer in and and, and pound it out, but. We all know reality is you're all busy, you guys are all busy, and so just wanted to ask that. Mm -hmm. um, maybe just another comment again, it, it seems to me that this study could be really helpful in, in sort of prioritizing where the city spends its energy, whether it's business development, whether it's creating the sort of cool space that might attract people, but you know, do you need, do you need businesses first or do you need a cool place first or do they come together you know how do you get people downtown so that they're enjoying the the cool space and going to restaurants and spending their money and doing all those things that we think of of a, a vibrant downtown so i think it's kind of a you know chicken or the egg type discussion and hopefully this provides some guidance in that i guess yeah motion a second it is a motion just a comment, if I can take off on what Eric said there, I agree with what Eric is saying. Um, I don't know if it's gonna be within the scope of this study, but it's nice to have a plan and establish a plan. We did that 12 years ago as well, but we didn't have a, uh, should I say, I don't believe we got the resources we need to show us how it's done in other cities and similar places and what we should target I know back then the discussion was uh, at the time a hot thing was like um, oh startup business uh, places or uh, boiler you know, what do they call them incubators. incubators that was hot I don't know if that even is anymore but the idea was to get get people downtown and that would spur you know additional activities but I don't know if that's covered in the scope but I think it would be really helpful for our economic development staff to understand other cities are in a similar scenario and what has worked for them so best practices instead of just saying well you know, here's the battle plan here's what we're going to do and we don't have any idea how to to get to that point so i think that's if that's not in the study that's fine but i think that's something we have to do like taking off on what eric said what what comes first or you know what should we target we i think too many times we've de we depend on the developers locally to come up with the great plans well, they have good plans, but I think a lot of them are pretty narrow focused on what works here and what's worked for them in the past. So uh, that's the only comment I'd make. I think this, otherwise you guys are, are right on here and I think it's gonna be money well spent. Appreciate that. And yeah, I would say, um, if I may, um, under, under number five, there are the other plan elements. I think, <clears throat> I think it was included here. I think we really do wanna emphasize the, the plan implementation. Um, being as specific as we can, with the recommendations and not being, you know, I think with the uh, West Fargo Twin O plan, you know, again, that was, it's a very high level plan. It's a comprehensive plan. Um, but as much as we can make this an actionable plan with specific, you know, steps and getting that information to your point about what has worked elsewhere and um, really spending a lot of time with the consultant on focusing in on um, how to make this a reality um, is, is always, I think, the, one of the biggest challenge, but to something that we want to um, make sure that we're focusing. So, I, I move to recommend approval. Second. I moved and seconded to make a recommendation to City Council to initiate the study. All those. Any further discussion before we vote? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Same side.
adjourn. Second. We'll be second to adjourn. I'll just have